Hey guys, it's Miss Sinclair for AP World History Modern. Today, we are continuing on with our Unit 2 lectures, and we are going to start talking about the Mongols. So, let's get started. For your bell work, I would like you to identify three things that can diffuse along the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean trade routes. Okay, so we'll be spending a good portion of the start of this unit on the Mongols. So um, let's first talk about sort of their rise and then their influence and spread. So this aligns with topic 2.2. Um, our objective for today is you will be able to explain the process of state building and decline in Eurasia over time. So we're focusing this time on the Mongol Empire in particular. So, Mongol Eurasia and its aftermath. We always start with geography. Um, Central Asia is very flat. It is um, steppes, S-T-E-P-P-E-S, -P -P -E not like those on a stair. So these are grasslands and shrublands with few trees. Um, the steppes border the Gobi Desert in this Siberian forest. Um, the houses, um, are portable, um, the environment is too, um, severe to really stay in one place the entire time, and so the people groups who live here are nomadic, so horses, um, are really effective and really important. So horses originate from this region in particular. Um, and, um, they are used to help you move from place to place because the steps have really brutal weather patterns, hot summers and cold, long winters. So the Mongols are just one of many nomadic groups living in Central Asia. So we talk a lot about these different nomadic groups. Um, we've talked about how nomadic groups have, you know, attacked Rome, how they've attacked China. Um, so there are lots of different nomadic groups living in Central Asia and the Mongols are going to just be one of these groups who ends up being very powerful. So the Mongols are a group of people um, a nomadic group living in Eurasia. Um, they are first mentioned during the Tang Dynasty. Um, and after 1200, um, they will form an enormous empire um, covering Eurasia under the leadership of Genghis Khan. So it's really important that you understand sort of nomadic society. So nomadism is a way of life, um, one that's really dictated by scarcity of resources. The carrying capacity of the natural environment is not enough to um, really allow for a sedentary society. So we see nomadic groups in Eurasia, we see it in the Great Plains of the Americas, we see it around the Arctic Circle, anywhere that um, the carrying capacity is just not sufficient. So we see with nomadic lifestyles, they're often um, pastoralists, so they're herders. Um, in this case, they're going to be herding goats and sheep. And so they will be constantly migrating to find pastures and waters for their herds. So they migrate in search of grazing lands and they move their yurts. So the home, and you can see this image here, is a yurt um, that's spelled Y-U-R-T-S, if you're curious. Um, it's made out of leathers and wood um, and always has a door, um, as well as a hole in the roof, so then you can have a fire inside, and they're quite cozy. Um, these nomads will often trade hides and dairy products for jewelry, weapons, and cloth. Um, 
You travel everywhere with your family. So this is very communal. So nomadic lifestyles tend to be much more communally oriented than urban lifestyles where you have like the rich here and the poor here and you know the men and the women don't really interact. Everyone's interacting with everyone at all times. Children are working side by side with their parents. So decisions are made in a council. Um, so decisions are made by a council and then a recommendation is made to the Khan. So the Khan is a leader of one of these Mongol tribes. So there's lots of tribes that work together. So this is very communal. There's very little hierarchy within the tribe. Menial work will be done by slaves who would be people who would be captured in war um, or you would find work as a slave um, if you had no other option and you didn't want to starve. So Mongol society is going to be really different from most of the societies that we have been learning about. It's so communal um, and you don't have a strict hierarchy. So Mongol society will be divided into multiple tribes. These tribes would usually combine during war um, when you had a common enemy. Um, but oftentimes these tribes would be at war with each other. So smaller tribes would pay tributes to bigger ones, allowing for the larger tribes to focus on warfare instead of herding. So we see that in Mongol society, there's a lot more equality between the sexes. Women from prestigious families could really wield power in negotiation and management. Your kinship lines were really important here. Who your family was um, is something that you would fight to the death over. Wives and mothers would manage state affairs during the interim time between a ruler's death and the selection of a successor. So the, um, the Khan, the leader, would not automatically be like the eldest son. Um, the council would um, choose who would be the next leader of their tribe. So these women would be respected and obeyed. And oftentimes women would manipulate political situations to get their sons into the position of Khan. We see that these um, nomadic groups are going to be coming in contact with lots of different religions and people groups, the different sedentary societies. So that means they are multi-religious. Tribes would have believers of multiple religions in it. Um, Christians, Buddhists, Muslims. But in general, most Mongols would still practice shamanism. So Mongols would believe in a great sky god um, who sort of transcended particular cultures and dominated all religions and places. So the idea is, oh, if you're Mongol, or sorry, if you're Muslim or Christian or Jewish or Buddhist, you're all worshiping the same God. He's just showing up to you in different ways. The Mongols are going to be famed fighters. They are accomplished horsemen. You learn at a young age, like as soon as you can hold your head up, you are sitting by yourself on a horse. And so they are really unmatched as a cavalry. They will use these short bows um, that they can fire while riding. They have incredible aim and they are highly effective against a sedentary army. Later, through contact with China, they will start to incorporate battering rams, cannons, catapults, flaming arrows, and even gunpowder into their warfare. So they will use um, the arrows, particularly at the beginning of a fight, and um, sort of draw out their enemy, and then will charge in with the sword, lance, javelin, and mace. Um, so they are going to be able to cover large distances quickly, um, and they are going to use a system of um, sort of messengers. Um, who will go from place to place to allow for information to spread very quickly um, in this um, large territory. So for them, the warrior code is bravery. You act as if you're immortal. You would not speak of death. Talking of death 
is a taboo, just like spilling blood is a taboo. So um, this was a huge part of warrior culture. So you see here, we got some catabolts. I think my gif of a flaming trebuchet is not gonna really work um, with loom, which is a bummer because it's super fun. Um, oh, there we go, boom. Imagine like in the night, like you all of a sudden have a ball of fire flung at your wall. How do you even fight that? It's pretty crazy. Um, so really as warriors, the Mongols are unmatched. Um, you have to understand they spend their entire life learning how to fight. Um, cause what else are you going to do? Um, it's not like it's an urban society where you can like go to the theater. Um, whereas your average soldier, um, defending a town is a farmer who just picks up a spear when they're under attack. They're not a skilled fighter. It's not like they're, you have standing armies. So you had a lot of really smart strategic tactics used by the Mongols. So one thing they would often do is they would have a group, a small group attack and then turn around and run away. And so the enemy would be like, oh, we've got them beat and start chasing after them. And so the enemy would be all spread out and vulnerable. And so the rest of the Mongol army, which was hiding ahead of time, would then pounce and attack, defeating the enemy very effectively. So I want you to take a moment to please describe Mongol society. What were some of the innovations used um, by the Mongols to become elite fighters? Let me um, actually go back real fast and talk about some other innovations um, and more tactics. So before they would ever attack, um, they would sort of use terrorism, um, often through deception. So they would attack small villages, and the goal here is not to kill people, but to spread fear. So they would cover their faces with blood and, you know, set fires and scare these villagers. So they would flee to the larger city. Um, the larger defensive fortress. So you have all of these people fleeing into the city and they're bringing with them stories. Um, the Mongols did this terrible thing. The Mongols did that terrible thing. They're so terrifying. They're monsters, blah, blah, blah. So they're spreading fear as they go. And then when the Mongols eventually besieged the wall city, the city would have more mouths to feed and, um, fewer resources to spend. They would use spies and informants to create maps of the areas they were going to invade ahead of time. They would um, burn undefended villages, um, stampede enemy herds of like sheep and goats towards the battlegrounds, just creating more chaos and, you know, destroying some of your resources. They would catapult the heads of dead soldiers and civilians over the walls, fill up the moats around a walled city with dead bodies, right? Terrorism. These are horrific things to do. So the Mongols are always going to practice total victory. The city could either surrender completely or it would be completely annihilated. There's no partial surrender. So they would often destroy a city in the region really brutally because of the fear that would spread. That means when they attacked other cities, they would be more likely to surrender. Okay, now I actually want you to answer this question. Describe Mongol society. What are some of the innovations used by the Mongols to become elite fighters? Okay, but let's start talking about Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan um, is going is really a title. So Khan is a title. So his name's actually Timujin, and he is going to rule the Mongols between 1206 and 1227. Genghis Khan translates to universal leader, and he's really going to be the founder of the Mongol Empire. So he's going to win uh, a reputation for being an excellent warrior, military leader, 
motivator, and visionary. And he's going to be responsible for organizing the Mongol tribes into a large confederation by breaking individual tribe loyalties and demanding loyalty to himself. One of the things that makes him an effective leader is he's going to promote based off merit, based off skill as opposed to birth. Right? I said bloodlines are really important in Mongol society. Well, Genghis Khan's going to ignore some of that. This is something that we see um, effective leaders doing um, whenever they take power, right? Octavian Augustus did the same thing. He is going to have a reputation, however, of being brutal and ferocious. So one of the things he implements is his great law. I don't remember. Do I have it? No, I don't. Um, so the great law is, hi, here we go, um, is going to be proclaimed after he unites the tribes to um, really end tribal feuding and discord. So this is why the Mongols never were a huge threat as an empire in the past was because they had so much infighting. So no more bastards. That means every child is legitimate. So that means there's no sparring over the fact of like, oh, your mother, you know, slept with this person. Your father's not really your father, right? There's no such thing as bastards anymore. So you stop fighting over it. No more kidnapping of women. This is going to be a really personal thing for um, Genghis Khan's life. And it's a, it was a very common practice in Mongol society. So a lot of times when one tribe would attack another, they, um, the men of that tribe would um, flee with the weapons. It sounds cowardly, but, you know, it's better to sort of the fight another day. So what would happen would be the women and some of, like, your herds would be captured by the enemy, and the goal would be you'd go and then recapture them. So Genghis Khan's mother is going to have been kidnapped um, and will, um, and so his father was not actually the man he grew up in, grew up with. Um, when his um, stepfather essentially is killed, um, his family is left really destitute and they're forced to sort of work as slaves. And you have this tension between um, sort of him um, and his mother, um, and then some of um, his um, stepfather's other children, right? Because um, a lot of times they were polygamous. When Genghis Khan's an adult, he is going to um, be married, and then shortly after his marriage, his wife will be kidnapped. So, same thing. He eventually gets her back, but when she comes back, she's pregnant, but they had been married. So there's some question always to his eldest son. Is his eldest son actually his son or the son of the guy who kidnapped and raped his wife? Um, this goes back to his no bastards rule. Like it doesn't matter. I don't want to do, I don't want to think about this. Um, he's going to outlaw adultery. That means um, you um, can't, you know, cheat on your wife, except in cases of a man and his female servants. Um, so, yeah, you can sleep with your female slaves, obviously, but don't go like sleeping with your neighbor's wife. Stop stealing animals. Um, and that is, to, again, have to prevent fighting. No hunting of animals during mating season. This is just responsible environmental practice to um, guarantee your food supply for the next year. Religious freedom to all Mongols. Um, and the position of supreme judge will be created. So I do want you to watch this video. Um, the the um, BBC did a whole documentary on Genghis Khan, but um, we aren't going to watch all of it. I just want you to watch a clip of it. So the early campaigns of Genghis Khan Well, the first thing he does is unite the Mongols. Um, you have all these separate tribes, and he is going to really um, pull them all together so they are one cohesive army. 
disciplined under one leader. And then he's going to start attacking the sedentary societies around him. So he's going to begin with the Xiexia Kingdom um, in northeastern China, and then the Jin Empire. So if you remember, we talked about the Xiexia and the Jin Empire as some of the people who were forcing the Sung Dynasty to go and become just the southern Sung. They're difficult to overtake, but he is going to use um, captured Chinese engineers to create powerful Chinese weapons for his own army to use. So this is one of the things that makes Genghis Khan a genius, is he's gonna really utilize the strengths of his enemies. Oh wow, you have this great way of fighting? Cool, cool, I wanna use that. Now that I've conquered, I'll conquered you, you work for me. So create these weapons for me. By 1219, he has conquered um, Karakitai and the Kormazan Empire, that's more Central Asia. His goal here is to create tribute empires. He's not so much interested in ruling territory as gathering wealth. So he will capture artisans, scholars, um, because he loves to learn, he loves to have beautiful things. And then he will kill or sell others into slavery. Mongols were known for fully devastating the towns they conquered. That usually meant enslavement and raping and pillaging. However, the empire he created was fairly stable. He's gonna establish a capital in Karakoram in um, sort of think Kazakhstan area, um, Mongolia area. Under Genghis Khan's rule, all religions and cultures will be tolerated. The Mongols aren't going to really assimilate to, well, let me clarify. The Mongols under Genghis Khan are not going to assimilate to the places they conquer. They're just gonna take the pretty things from the places that they conquered and bring them back home. So that means it doesn't really matter to um, Genghis Khan if you wanna continue speaking your indigenous language. If you want to keep worshiping your local god, cool, whatever, just give me all of your gold. He will have an alphabet created for the Mongolian language. The Mongol conquests will actually bring peace to these regions. Um, so this is what will allow for the Silk Roads to form. Because all of this territory will be ruled by one empire, the roads are safe and secure. There will be um, soldiers monitoring them. So if you get mugged, you are going to be able to um, like essentially call the police. Um, you will um, tax the um, traders and the items traveling along the Silk Roads. So he's more interested in collecting tribute from territories than administering an empire. In 1226, he is going to take an army of 80,000 to um, conquer um, China. And it's not going to work. He's going to die. So he, he'll be killed in battle and his body will be taken back to Karakoram. Um, prior to this, Genghis Khan is really worried about what would happen to his empire after he died. Um, because he has all these sons from all of these different wives, um, and he's worried that these sons would be in competition competition with each other. So what he decided to do was what was done with Alexander the Great's empire. He decided to divide it up among his sons. Ultimately, this act will weaken the empire. So the remaining land will be divided into four ways, and his son Ogedai will become the next great Khan. So Ogedai will direct more troops to more conquests, he, um, by 1234, um, northern China will really be, all right, here we go, um, will be controlled um, by um, the Mongols, and he'll really begin threatening the Sung Dynasty. So here's Genghis Khan. Here's his first son, Jochi, the one where you're like, ooh, is he a bastard? I don't know. Then he will have Jagadai, Ogadai, who becomes the next great Khan and his son, who's significantly younger, Tuloi. In many ways, the 
um, grandsons of Genghis Khan are going to be more relevant than the um, his direct sons. His um, essentially part of the deal that makes Ogadai the next great Khan. Essentially, Jochi claimed that he should be the next great Khan. Jai Kadai said, I want to be the next great Khan. You're a bastard. I'm truly the eldest. Ogadai's a drunk. He's not really threatening. So he's kind of the compromise candidate. And in return, um, Jochi is going to travel and to conquer more land since he um, was refused his heritage. So his son, Batu, Genghis Khan's grandson, will be the one who conquers Russia and establishes the Golden Horde of Russia. Ogadai's um, son, um, Ogadai will die, um, and this will force Batu to return, protecting Western Europe from the Mongols, and um, Ogadai's son will be made the next great Khan. We see that um, Hulugu is going to conquer Persia um, and the Abbasids and create the Ilkhan Empire. Um, and then, of course, Kublai Khan, who is the really big one, who's going to conquer Sung China and establish a Chinese dynasty. So here's our map with the grandsons. The um, green outlined territory was complete, once all part of uh, or is all part of the Mongol territory. Um, sort of this green part, Khanate of the Great Khan, will be what was ruled by Kublai Khan. The Chai Kedai, um Empire here in the center is sort of the Mongol homeland, and that will be ruled by um, Guik, um, Ogadai's son. The Khanate of the Golden Horde will be what was established by Batu, and then the Il Khanate will be established by Hulugu. Okay, I do want you to watch this video. Um, I really love these history versus videos because it's a great look at um, perspective um, and historical interpretation. So um, in this video, you will see two interpretations of Genghis Khan's leg legacy. Is he a murderer or is he a visionary? Um, and it really just demonstrates how history is all interpretation. So, again, here are the four Khanates that emerge out of um, Genghis Khan's empire. Um, so, what are the long-term impacts here? Um, we see that um, Commercial integration will impact all parts of the empire. So yeah, you have, you know, this infighting, but in general, they're going to work well together. They're not fighting with each other. You can still be a merchant and travel across all these territories and be safe. So because of this commercial integration, we see that silk, porcelain, and art styles diffuse across Eurasia. Merchants, ambassadors, scholars, and missionaries will all travel along these roads. Marco Polo will travel along these roads to go visit the Great Khan, a.k.a. Kublai Khan. Um, he's a Venetian uh, merchant who is going to write essentially our first travel literature. Um, so Western Europe is getting more and more in contact with the rest of the world. They even had passports a metal medallion um, that they would wear and essentially say they had permission to travel. So depending on the metal that your medallion was made out of really showed how important you were. Of course, diseases will spread along this as well. Um, the bubonic plague will be the most infamous. So the bubonic plague, the Black Death, is going to be a bacterial disease transmitted by fleas. And um, humans in the late stages of the illness can spread the bacteria by coughing. But it will really start in China and then spread to the rest of the world because of its high mortality rate and difficulty with preventing its spread. Major outbreaks will cause crises in many different parts of the world. However, bubonic plague is not the only disease to trans um, to be transferred on 
um, the, these silk roads. Typhus, influenza, smallpox will all travel along this road. And the great pandemic, um, which is bubonic plague, will kill more than any Mongol attack ever did. So what accounts for the magnitude and the speed of the Mongol conquest? Essentially, how was Genghis Khan able to conquer so much so fast? 